were doing battle with the state going back and forth, they said this is what we feel our, our county should look like and how it should proceed in the future. Uh, unfortunately, the state of Oregon, did, DLCDC or LCDC, did not agree with us on this. So we did back and forth battles with the, with the state through our planning office, and eventually the state says, we are going to put an enforcement order on you if you do not adopt the plan that we feel is best for your county. And we, that enforcement order, what that meant was they could withhold state funding to our programs up to an amount that they had given us as far as grants for putting the thing together over all these years. And they had the authority of just taking that money. And it could amount up to several hundred thousands of dollars. So that forced us into this having to acknowledge and adopt a plan that was really not our plan or the citizen plan, but a plan that was put together by the state of Oregon, DLCD. And uh, that's the kind of plan that we're fighting today. As you hear, the land use issues that keep coming up is uh, properties that the county government had said ought to be rural residential lands. But the state of Oregon says, no, they need to be resource, either forest uh, commercial or uh, woodlot or farm resource lands. And they were all marginal type of lands. Had we been given those zones back when we first asked for them, we would not be doing the fighting today and the landowners would not have put out the kind of money they have to put out today to try to get what their land really should be zoned. One of the, uh, I think, issues that, that probably really highlights what's happened to the people in uh, Oregon, especially Josephine County, is the Ward Ockenden uh, land use application that, that came into our system. Ward's property years ago was in rural residential zoning and through all of this process wound up going into a resource category. You can see clearly that this is not timberland and you can't grow enough timber on this property to be commercially viable for forestry. But I was required to hire all kinds of experts to prove, prove it on paper that this was not viable forest land. As you can see by the trees, they're really small. It is, it's clearly non-forest land, but it would make a gorgeous piece of property to do development on. In 1992, I went down to the planning office to get a permit to put a house on this piece of property here. And the man at the counter at the time, Bob Hart, told me, look, he says, your property was zoned residential five acre zoning it, and it should, be, it should go back to that. So he, he looked in his book at the counter and he says, yeah, it, everything qualifies, it looks good. Fill out this application, pay us the fee, and you're good to go. I've met Ward when I worked at the planning office. Um, I worked there for 17 years and evaluated land use applications. When he first came in and asked about the development of his property, I said it looks like this is a pretty simple and straightforward application. The soils that show on the official maps are not good for farm or forest land, so there's a, a process to go through, should be able to go through a, a hearing with the planning commission and the board and have it approved. Uh, it seems like a, a pretty reasonable request. We should be able to stop right there. We had our meeting scheduled at the, at the, at, at the county courthouse. Uh, I presented my case. It was about one minute long. It wasn't much to say. Uh, there was about 45 to 50 activists on the other side, though, that stood up against me. There, there's a whole set of people that seem dead set against property development. They've become land use activists, and they'll show up and oppose any application, whether they live even close to the property or not. Uh, with this, it, the tactic has been delay, delay, delay uh, by filing appeals, uh, raising frivolous information about things that all have to be responded to, uh, driving the, the property owner to the point that he can't afford to go on. After my planning meeting I had there, I realized that, uh, with the planning commission, I realized that we had to, um, I had to get some help. It didn't seem like it was a one-man show at that time. It didn't seem like an easy process. Went back to the planning office and I said, look, I'm a little nervous. I, I saw all these people opposing me and I thought this was an easy process. Well, the man says at the counter again, he says, look, you need, you probably need to hire some professionals. You need an attorney, you need to get a topo map made, you need a soil scientist. And I'm going, oh my goodness. I says, I didn't realize all, you know, I had to hire all these specialists just to rezone my property. It, it should be a simple process. Well, I, I started out hiring a, I had to get a topo map made. That was like $25,000 back in 93 to have a topo map made. I had to hire a soil, soil scientist so we could go over the property and check the soils out and see what kind of slopes I had and what, the, what kind of soil types I had. 
um, had to have an attorney because I felt that I couldn't represent myself anymore because it was too complicated. So the cost of my little project that I thought was minimal has es escalated to a, a lot of dollars I had to spend. It used to be that it, the land use process was fairly simple, that we could come in, take a look at a, a piece of property, uh, make a, a, an internal determination of is it good or bad for development, um, and that was something that the planners did at the county level. Now with all the requirements, uh, the cost of getting a project ready to v develop is astronomical anymore. The things that you have to have prepared to, to make it happen, you have to have a, a geologist, soil scientist, civil engineer, geotechnical engineer, hydrologist, well driller, septic installer, land use planner. So in the spring of, of 1993, I had hired my experts, my soil scientist, my attorney, and I had my topo map, topo, uh, topographical map made. And we went before the planning commission, and we uh, we put on our case, and they they overwhelmingly approved my my land zoning. So I thought that was a good it was a good thing to go forward with then at that point. And so at, at that time, it was around July, and and my, I married my lovely wife Jenny here. And uh, we started uh, going forward with our lives together, and uh, uh, it was, um, you know, it was a great time. So we uh, time. we were looking forward to the um, we were looking forward to uh, the next phase of, of our planning Having efforts. Having a family? What? <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with you? Was that wrong? No, that was great. That was great. You should know <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh my word. The Rural Planning Commission heard my case and approved it overwhelmingly. From there it went to the Board of County Commissioners where they approved it overwhelmingly. But the local land use activists of our community appealed it to the Land Use Board of Appeals. They sent it back to the County Commissioners on a remand. LUBA, which is called the Land Use Board of Appeals, was created under the Senate Bill 100 to become the watchdog of any land use applications that would come through and people were challenging. And historically, anyone that has any indication of uh, protecting property rights would never and has never been appointed to that body. What has developed over the last number of years is that there are people who uh, have appointed themselves guardians of the land use process and they participate in every appeal. One of the goals of uh, Senate Bill 100 when it was originally adopted was to have the public participate in this process. But what has in fact occurred is one member of the public uh, can frustrate uh, the owner of a small subdivision, whether it's five or six or two, uh, two houses that they hope to develop, <clears throat> that project can be stymied literally for years. The application was approved by the Board of County Commissioners in 1994. Uh, the first appeal was based on a technicality about soils. The soil scientists for the state of Oregon said, we've changed our standards and the, the soils that you show on your maps, we don't use those anymore, we have new soils and the activist appealed saying that these new soils required that the whole comprehensive plan be re-amended to add these new soils into the system. Um, they told the applicant he needed to go get the information to be able to put into the system and describe these new soils. So the commissioners recommended that I would hire another soil scientist to, to go through this and make sure we can fix this problem so it wasn't going to get kicked back to Luba again. We brought in foresters and showed that these new soils were actually poorer soils for timber growth, but we needed to redocument and start all over and show why these soils are so bad for forest reuse, where the original soils uh, were defined by the county as non-forest in nature. Uh, we had to get a text amendment done. We got that put through. But at the, before that was over, the, the activists brought up another soil type, so it was stopped at that, at, at, that, at that hearing. So here I had to go again and hire a soil scientist again and prove this point. By the time I got that done, I, I had realized that there, it's going to go on and on forever on this case. There was no end in sight. 
but I'm not going to give up. And I'm, I'm going to fight this on principle and I'm going to fight this through. In uh, the case of comprehensive plan amendments and zone changes, there is no state requirement to have the, the process culminated in any specific time. It can run on for years and years. It not only uh, makes the process more cumbersome, but uh, quite a bit more expensive to have uh, all the uh, appeal uh, steps utilized that are put in place. And my own opinion is that some of the people have become very good at manipulating that system to, to their end, to simply delay and put off the project rather than to uh, address themselves to concerns innate to the project. We reapplied to the county with all the information that was needed and necessary uh, during the hearings process. New uh, objections were raised by the land use activists uh, about traffic situations uh, miles away at the Merlin Interchange. We had to bring in a traffic engineer, do a new study, and show that that could be fixed as well. Um, and it appeared at that point that the county commissioners were convinced that it was not good resource land and they wanted to uh, change it to a, a residential uh, designation but they wanted to appease land use activists so after the hearing was closed and nobody else could comment they came up with a, 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 a new scheme saying yes we're going to change it to residential land but they put an arbitrary limit on it uh, the state says you can't have more than 10 lots in a plan unit development and because the property was 157 acres, the county on the spot came up with a new zone called an RR15, where they took the 157 acres, divided it by the 10 lots, and said, okay, uh, we're going to require this new zone of an RR15, and they approved the project. I've determined in my review of the materials and testimony presented that this land is not suitable for farm or forest production. I move to reverse the Planning Commission's denial of the application and approve the map amendment by amending the Josephine County Comprehensive Plan and zoning maps for the subject property by changing the designations from forest slash woodlot resource and farm slash farm resource to rural residential 15 acre minimum. After that decision, I, um, I, I put the pencil to it and I figured there was no way I could develop my piece of property at this point. It was a done deal. The activists won because it wasn't cost effective to develop 10 lots and put, 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 put roads on my property. At that point, I approached Ward and I said, Ward, because these, uh, this zone was a brand new zone that was never uh, put into the code, you ought to try and ask for a rehearing to open it back up, convince them that you can develop the property at less than 15 acre sizes um, so let's take another run at it. So at, at this point, I thought uh, I thought we didn't have a chance, but I I didn't want to give up. I, I didn't want them to win at this. So I, I went and went to our local chapter, Americans for Prosperity, and asked them to help me. And they showed up in force, and overwhelmingly we got we got our meeting opened up again. The reason we've asked the board to reopen the hearing is because of the specific and extraordinary conditions and circumstances that have surrounded this case. This has been in and out of the county process for over 15 years, almost 20 now. It's been to Luba twice. It's been before this board and previous commissioners. The comprehensive plan amendment and zone change has been approved. I think this will be at least the third time that the comp plan and zone change was approved by the Board of County Commissioners. The reason that we've asked for it is the uh, extra conditions that were added by this board that were not added by previous boards and we think that there needs to be an opportunity to further address the issues. The conditions that were added was that the property be rezoned to RR15 that there be a limitation that the property only be developed by a planned unit development and that the road that is built as a part of the project would be limited to a private street as a part of the PUD. These conditions are, in my estimation, extraordinary. 
They're not normally something that is attached to a zone change. The one question that everybody has <coughs> kind of raised is the RR15 zone that was uh, applied to the property. We find that nowhere in the county codes that there is such a, a, a thing as an RR15. Um, so everybody's questioning the, the, the applicability of the decision. Yeah, it was probably my fault that we uh, that we went RR15 and um, and we uh, talked about a PUD and the conditions you know uh, that we established on you. And I do agree that we did not give the applicant time to uh, to address those conditions that we placed. I would uh, make a motion um, that we do reopen this hearing um, with the date of October the 29th specifically limiting that hearing to carrying capacity and the conditions that were put on by the Board of County Commissioners at the previous hearing. But they raised the, the issues that the land use activists had uh, raised before about traffic and, and additional information. We had to completely design a subdivision plan that is never a part of a zone change and it added another $40,000 burden to the property to even address the concerns during this new hearing. And at that hearing, again, I went to the Americans for Prosperity and I told them my problem and they came out in great support and we actually, for the first time, again, we filled the auditorium, outnumbered the activist. So it was a great showing and I think that's what helped us get this, get this turned around. Um, this hearing, we are deciding whether or not to rezone this piece of property. Uh, from Woodlot Resource Forest uh, to uh, Residential Rural 5. I have heard expert testimony, people that are credential engineers, credentialed in their field, offering testimony on behalf of the proponent. On the opponent's side, they had the opportunity to have uh, credentialed opponents come up here and challenge the evidence that we heard from the, for the proponents, and we did not hear that. Everything we have heard today from the opponents is opinion, and it does not carry the same weight as an expert testimony. After reviewing the new information, I feel that uh, the 15-acre restriction was too restrictive for this size of property. After I looked at uh, a possible tentative layout for uh, the number of lots and uh, the rest of the information, uh, I'm inclined to uh, approve an RR5 uh, with uh, no restrictions as to lot size. I'll make a motion to reverse the Planning Commission's denial of the application and to approve the map amendment by amending the Josephine County Comprehensive Plan and zoning maps for the subject property by changing the designations from forest, woodlot resource, and farm resource to rural residential five acre minimum RR5 for the 157.93 acres located in the 3200 block of Hugo Road. I'll second the motion. Motion from Commissioner Ellis, second from Commissioner Raffenberg. Sounds like I'm gonna be the dissenting vote here and uh, two votes is what matters. So uh, uh, consider it perhaps practice for any future, uh, uh, any future action that might take Place. Please call roll. Commissioner Raffenberg? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Ellis? Yes. Commissioner Toller? No. Motion passes two to one. The land use in Oregon has um, been out of sync with the, uh, the will of the people since uh, Senate Bill 100 was passed back in uh, 1973. Uh, Mr. Ockenden uh, has uh, had a 17 year saga of trying to uh, actually use his property in a way that uh, was actually legitimate for him to use it. Previous boards of commissioners have approved it uh, and uh, special interest land use activists have uh, consistently afforded the effort of uh, this particular individual to use his property. And it's not, uh, not in a unique situation. Uh, the system in Oregon uh, is broken. Had the state of Oregon accepted Josephine County's recommendation Ward would have never had to go through this hearing process that he's gone in today. So it's been going on for almost 17 years. This is not the county's plan. It was never the county's plan because when we submitted our plan, the state of Oregon said, no, this is what we want you to have. 
And so it was, it was actually LCDC or DLCD's plan that wound up getting adopted. And they have basically removed themselves from the process during the period. They said, no, the county has to adopt it by ordinance, which then removes them from this problem. They are no longer the, it's not their plan, it's the county's plan under the ordinances. And so they, they, they could say, well, it isn't ours, it was the county that did it to you. After, uh, after Senate Bill 100 was passed, uh, I don't think anybody anticipated that it would end up being a hammer used against people's uh, private property rights and their ability to use their property. Uh, the system was put into place because people were afraid that Oregon would become a, a megalopolis like California. And that's what, how it was sold to the people of Oregon. Uh, but unfortunately, when, when uh, laws are passed, uh, they don't have all the details in them. And the, the bureaucracy of state government creates administrative rules. And those rules are used to subvert people's property rights. Uh, no legislator voted on those rules. Uh, they, they, don't, uh, uh, they don't review them. They don't make sure that they're in line with, with the intent of the original law. And uh, since uh, what we have in Oregon now is a, a very well-organized uh, anti-growth um, segment of a population that uses those rules to uh, beat people over the head and to prevent them from using their property. Uh, the system wasn't designed for that, but yet it has become that. It, is, it, has, de de it has devolved into that type of uh, situation. People are denied their rights every day in Oregon by people that really don't have any, uh, any legitimate interest in the property that, uh, that they're opposing being developed. What is really frustrating, uh, as I say, uh, are those that have nominated themselves for whatever reasons they are their own, uh, their own reasons, they're going to appeal every approval that comes down the pike, uh, either because they don't like development per se, or they don't like development in their backyard, or they've always enjoyed the view on the side of the mountain and they wanted to stay there, free of charge to them. Uh, I, I wish that the system uh, was designed in such a way that if you don't have a, a real tangible effect coming to you by the approval of the project, that this doesn't involve you. The system allows these people with no investment uh, other than their time uh, to thwart uh, projects, to make them, uh, uh, to, to delay them to the point to where most people just flat quit because they can't afford to continue the fight. The holding costs of having the financing in place, starting this project and then having to stop and wait for the appeal and then maybe wait for another round of appeals and then maybe wait for yet further appeals. The uh, cost to individual developers is uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, I don't think it's unrealistic uh, in some cases for that figure to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. These rules are being used consistently to uh, uh, not only deny people's property rights, but it ends up destroying their lives. It has created a bureaucracy that is, in, jo in Josephine County, Oregon alone, is pushing a million dollars a year to, to operate. And that is driving the cost up for everybody. It drives the cost up for development. It drives the cost up uh, in, in tax bases. It, it, it creates a fee base that is prohibitive for, for an average person to even go down and uh, do a simple addition onto their home. From the county standpoint, there is the, the cost of the um, planning department personnel uh, to staff and coordinate, facilitate the actual hearings, uh, e either before the planning commission or the county commissioners. Uh, there's the cost of the uh, commissioner's time and staff to, to process the, the appeals, render the decision, uh, make the findings supporting that decision. And then in many of these cases, what's referred to as the record uh, that has to be prepared for the appeals to LUBA are 
seven, eight, nine hundred pages long. Um, so obviously to say it's voluminous amount of paperwork is an understatement. And it's not just one case, it's case after case, a series of cases being appealed uh, where you've got these uh, humongous records. And um, as I say, it is easily tens of thousands of dollars uh, just in terms of county staff and time and expenses to process the appeals. The cost per lot has gone up considerably over the years to where it's a uh, uh, driving property. To, it's over $200,000 to have a lot ready to, to build on. And that's just the, the cost to be able to get it to that point. That's not counting the value of the property itself. Mr. Ockton, like I said, it was a victim. There are other victims in this county. There are victims throughout the state of Oregon. And uh, it's, uh, when, when, when government's broken, it's up to the people to fix it. Uh, and that takes hard work. After 17 years of trying to get my property rezoned to Residential 5, finally the Board of, the board of Commissioners finally did that. But now the land use activists filed a LUBA appeal against me again. It, that's to the Land Use Board of Appeals. And now I got to start fighting all over again. Who knows when it's going to stop, when it's going to end, but it's probably going to be an excess from six months to another four years of fighting on this, on this issue right now. I have spent an excess already of over $600,000 to get to this point. And now who knows how much more money I got to spend? Is it a hundred, two hundred, four hundred thousand dollars? Who knows? Thank you.